This is Beyond the Big Screen Podcast with your host, Steve Guerra. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Big Screen Podcast, where we talk about great movies and stories so great they should be movies. Links to learn more about our guest today can be found in the show notes. You can support Beyond the Big Screen on Patreon.com. By joining on Patreon, you help keep Beyond the Big Screen sustainable and get many great benefits. Go to Patreon.com forward slash Beyond the Big Screen to learn more and sign up. Find show notes, links to subscribe, and leave Apple Podcast reviews by going to our website, BeyondTheBigScreen.com. And now, let's go beyond the big screen. I would very much like to thank Dr. David Fletcher to the show today. Previously, Chris and I talked about the movie and the book on Eight Men Out and the whole 1919 Black Sox World Series fix scandal. Dr. Fletcher is the president of the Clear Buck Weaver Foundation, clearbuck.com. Dr. Fletcher is going to guide us through one of the players Chris and I had the hardest time wrapping our, our heads around. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for the invitation. It's always nice to be able to uh, keep uh, Buck's name in the news and let people learn about the story, even though it's been more than 100 years. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about how you got involved in the case to clear Buck Weaver's name? I was always fascinated by the story of the Black Sox, even as a uh, as a child growing up in um, Peoria, Illinois, when I was a kid. I had a baseball book that my parents gave me. I was just fascinated about the story. And that sort of was the genesis. And then um, I became a, you know, a big a White Sox fan when I moved to Chicago and learned more about the story. And, and as a big interest in history and baseball, I really poured my heart and soul into the, uh, the story. And I was fascinated by the, the movie of Eight Men Out that came out in 1988 that John Sales had directed. I had previously read Eight Men Out that was published in 1963 by Eric, by Elliot Ezenoff. So that was sort of my genesis. I knew the story well, and I just felt that I had to do something about it. And um, it was the kind of call to duty to see what was going on in the current story. I had heard there were some efforts to reinstate him in the late, uh, late 1990s. And so that was sort of the beginning. And so I decided to reach out to his family and to see what I could do to help. What was um, the 10,000 foot background story on Buck Weaver? How did he wind up in playing for the White Sox in 1919? Well, he had played there all his career. Um, he had been um, in the minor leagues until 1910. And then he started out originally at shortstop, was moved to uh, third base. Uh, he was a player that got better with age. In the beginning, he made a lot of errors. His batting average wasn't that good. And then by the last couple of years of play, he really improved. And he was on this 1917 World Championships team the White Sox had in 1918. He um, was doing military service in, in Beloit, Wisconsin. But 1919, he had a, a breakout year. Uh, and in, in 1920, uh, after the World Series, up until the time he was suspended at end of September, uh, he was having a fantastic season as well. Eight Men Out is kind of the canonical version of the story, almost the official version. Things have changed in the last couple of years, but, but prior to that, the Eight Men Out by, and Elliot Asinov's telling was really the official story. What were some of the things that maybe Asinov didn't get quite right about Buck Weaver? Well, there's a lot he didn't get right. And there's a lot of stuff he didn't investigate that would have made the story a little more accurate. I don't know if you're aware, I actually met Elliot several times. Oh, no. no and, way. and I went to his house uh, in New York in 2003 uh, in September and uh, saw some of the basic information on his research there. We had discussed in detail about the uh, background, how he came about to the book. So I have 
uh, a little bit more understanding about what Eight Man Out. I basically feel it's a great first effort about telling the story, um, but it has a lot of errors. And he had not taken advantage of archives that were available in the Milwaukee court system that would have helped him tell the story better. And um, he did not access all the stuff that was for the Joe Jackson trial in Milwaukee when Jackson sued uh, Charles Comiskey uh, for his back pay after he got kicked out of baseball. And that was available that uh, Elliot could have gotten. He basically, his book was just a few sources. Um, the judge in the case, uh, Hugo Friend, was his, one of his main sources. And the only player who was his main source was Happy Felch. Uh, the other players that were still living wouldn't talk to him. Um, he did get some help from uh, Red Faber about the book. But primarily, his source was, was a judge and um, Happy Felch were his major sources for the book. And also uh, Abe Attell, who was one of the fixers, uh, had spent a lot of time with uh, Elliot and given him the background story. There, I've uh, read there's a uh, Sports Illustrated from, I believe, 1958 that was written, article written by Chick Gandel. And it's very frustrating to, uh, to read because... Chick Gandel takes absolutely no responsibility for anything in there. But uh, one of the things is nobody in any of the sources you read, nobody ever thought that Buck Weaver had anything to do with the fix. Ray Shock didn't even include him on one of the people that he uh, thought was involved in the fix at all. So how does Buck Weaver get caught in this uh, snowball that starts rolling in 1920? Well, he got caught in it because he wasn't entirely innocent in the fact he did participate in some of the pre-planning meetings that had been conducted about that. Um, you're referring to the article of Chick Gandel was done in 1956, where Chick Gandel, Gandel quotes Buck Weaver about, you know, we should just take the money and double cross him and win the series. There's a quote in that article. Um, so Buck definitely had been to a couple of meetings and he basically decided not to participate. And he, you know, put it all out in the field. Uh, he had a fabulous World Series, didn't make any errors, you know, batted over 300. He was you know, instrumental in the, in the White Sox wins. So he basically had started out being part of the, of the scheme, decided not to participate. And his eventual crime, if you can call it a crime, was that he didn't rat on his teammates and, and, and turn them in. Uh, historically, it's pretty clear that you know, Charles Comiskey knew from after the first game that the series was fixed. And instead of taking his players off the field and finding out what's going on, he let the series continue. Obviously, it was a big financial thing after World War I. They had expanded the World Series to, to a nine-game set. And uh, it was would have been very difficult to take out your way out your stuff. Steve here again. We are a member of the Parthenon Podcast Network, featuring great shows like Chris Mowery's Vlogging Through History and many other great podcasts. Go over to Parthenon Podcast to learn more. And now here's a quick word from our sponsors. Buck Weaver was the, he loved the game. He loved baseball. And it's pretty clear from the statistics that he did put in 100% effort. One of the things that the other players kind of used as a narrative, at least to build, is that they weren't getting paid and compensated fairly. How, and we, we know now uh, that there's statistics and records on how much they were getting paid. Would you say that Buck Weaver was getting compensated fairly? for his talent level and the position that he was playing? I do, based on his uh, unusual, he had a three-year deal, and they took away the reserve clause that they could, you know, uh, permit his contract. It was a guaranteed deal. It was the same thing that Joe Jackson had. They were one of the few players to get that, a three-year deal rather than a one-year deal. And eventually, Buck was able to get money back from Comiskey. He sued Comiskey in federal court. And he got his 1921 uh, wages. So 
it's basically what, what the story is, is that this is obviously I know this because, you know, having spent time with Elliot and talked to him, he wanted a dramatic hook to this book, Eight Men Out. He wanted to portray Kaminsky as a villain. And it's really an unfair portrayal because this, the wages that the White Sox were paid were in the upper echelon of the American League compared to other players. And so he's unfairly painted of being uh, some villainous character because he didn't you know, pay his players. And that was Asinoff's whole story of why they did the um, the fix was, you know, because they felt they were not being paid fairly. Uh, and that's really not true when you go back and look at things. And I think that's pretty much emerged pretty clear in the last 15 years. Now, uh, Buck Weaver, like you said, he really, his, he, the, the whole reason he got caught in this is that he didn't rat out or, or in, in some way tell that there was these meetings going on, which isn't ideal, clearly. But why did they, he was cleared of conspiracy charges, which that's kind of its own whole different thing. But why did they really drop the hammer in such a draconian fashion on Buck, who was kind of peripheral to the whole thing? Well, that's obviously it was the misery his family had, you know, seeing Buck being kicked out of baseball, that his role was relatively minor, that he they would have been OK with like a one year suspension or something like that, not a lifetime ban forever. Um, the reason is, is because baseball changed in that until 1920, baseball had this national commission set up with three different people uh, that would run that one from the American League, one from the National League, and then they would decide who would be the third person. And that didn't work. And there was a need to restructure the game to uh, bring it to the next level. And they really felt they needed a strong uh, commissioner type of person. And that's when Judge Landis, who was a Chicago federal judge who had previously got his name to fame because of the Standard Oil case, uh, where he had fined Standard Oil on godly amount of money. But he was a perfect almost a Hollywood casting character to come in and rule baseball with an iron fist. And his decision the day after the conspiracy trial uh, ended in August of 2021 was to initiate this uh, lifetime time ban or an eternal ban uh, for the eight players. Do you think that was... <laughs> Even generally, even fair for the players who were involved. Like I, Chick Gandal was out of baseball; he retired. Do you think? And Happy Felsch, maybe you could, or not Happy Felsch, rather, um, Swede Risberg. You can almost see that he should have had a draconian punishment. But in degrees, do you think all of these players should have been banned from baseball for life? Well, I think it was um, the medicine that baseball needed. To, and, and unfortunately, you know, Buck got caught up in that. I mean, he is the, you know, the prime example of having other players should tell baseball authorities that they see some wrongdoing, whether it's steroid use or, uh, you know, betting or throwing games. So the decision by Landis, though, it was draconian for Buck, I think for the rest of the players, was a necessary message to help clean up baseball, which had a terrible, terrible gambling problem prior to um, Judge Landis's edict. Certainly the uh, Black Sox situation in 1919 was not baseball's original sin. And so, uh, you know, in fact, there's pretty credible evidence that the Cubs and Red Sox series in 1918, uh, which was played at Comiskey Park because of the uh, the federal park, where, which became Wrigley Field, was too small of seats to, to have a crowd, and they decided to play at Comiskey. But it's pretty credible that that series was fixed as well. Yeah, so much, so much fixing. And that was really a transitional year. There's so many what ifs with Buck Weaver's career. Do you think we get a little taste of how he would have done it in the live ball era? How do you do you think that he would have transitioned well into this whole new baseball that was a lot more heavy hitting and with and more fast paced with uh, a lot more home runs and a lot more movement? Uh, I think he would have done very well. I mean, I believe he was a a, a player 
a lot like the careers of like Sandy Koufax or Dennis Eckersley, who are not very good in the first part of their career and just kept getting better and better. And that's what was with 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 Buck in 2000 in 1920. He batted 333. Um, he had 210 hits in uh, in 151 games. I think he would have uh, would have gone on, and I think he would have been you know, a Hall of Fame lock if he had played long. If he didn't play, he only played nine seasons. He had to have ten seasons to go in Cooperstown. His career was cut short. Um, so I, I really do believe that he would have had a really um, further improvement in the game with the, with a more livelier ball. But he was also just becoming a stellar third baseman, and that was uh, the um, thing that really got his. Um, teammates as well as opposing teams that really thought he was, you know, the best third, third baseman there, especially on fielding bunts. Uh, Buck played in a couple of renegade leagues and uh, he continued to live in Chicago afterwards. How did this affect the rest of his life? That was a kind of a black cloud over his life or did he move past it? Well, he tried to move past it. I mean, this is where, you know, I became very close to, to the family and including um, his niece, who he, who became his surrogate daughter, he had, he adopted, didn't officially adopt her, but she lived in their home since 1927, and up until the time she got married in the early 1950s. So she was able to give tremendous insight about Buck and 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 how he dealt with it, and uh, he was never ashamed of his role because. Clearly, he didn't take any money and he played to win. Uh, it devastated him because he loved baseball and he loved the White Sox. I mean, and of all the eight players, he's the only one that stayed in Chicago. He's buried in Chicago, at Mount Hope uh, Cemetery in the south side. Um, his wife, Helen's buried next to him on an unmarked, unmarked grave. He lived in the south side. Uh, so he, he continued to, to be publicly out there. Um, he did a lot of, besides the renegade leagues, he did a lot of exhibition leagues, played in Hammond, Indiana. Uh, he wanted to be a coach, uh, for women's baseball with the, with the, with the Bidwell family. Uh, he was not allowed to do that. Um, he continued to have contact with his, uh, teammates. He'd go to a lot of postseason events, uh, Red Faber and, and, uh, uh, Ray Schalk, you know, continuously, uh, were with him. Uh, he would give commentary on uh, baseball. He did some uh, reporting, he did some radio shows, did a radio show with Jack Brookhouse uh, in the early 50s before he died in 56, still to the end saying he was innocent. And he did a famous last interview with James T. Farrell, who wrote this book, My Baseball Diary. And Farrell is, is, had written a book that he didn't finish before he died. Uh, that was recently redone about four or five years ago. That, and I think it needs to be said that uh, Eight Men Out was basically uh, a book given to him by James Farrell. I mean, James Farrell helped Elliot Asanoff tremendously on his book, Who to Talk to and His Resources. So I think the bottom line is, you know, Buck was, he never felt ashamed. He was disappointed. He loved baseball, but he, he, didn't, he didn't hide. The ironic thing is that he ended up being, he, he worked um uh, at uh, Hawthorne Park in the bedding windows. Uh, he worked as a painter. He, he worked in a florist shop. He helped his brother-in-law, um, Scanlon, uh, with a drugstore. And that's how he ended up uh, taking in Scanlon's daughters when he died um, of appendicitis in the, in the late 20s. So uh, he never went away from the, from the uh, public scene when he had his, when his funeral was in uh, in 1956, it, it was attended, you know, by a large crowd. He was uh, beloved by the Southside fans. Do you think that there was uh, was the a scandal always popular? You might say, or at least in the forefront of people's minds all throughout the 50s and the the 40s and the 50s, or did it kind of simmer down? Well, it, it simmered down. I mean, after you know, Buck made many attempts to get reinstated. Um, and he was unsuccessful with multiple steps, spent a lot of money hiring lawyers and things like that. It pretty much died down after the 1930s started. Um, 
because all the teammates that they had retired from baseball, uh, Landis was getting more and more powerful. He was not going to change his mind. He was, he had been very firm about, you know, keeping Buck out that, you know, birds of a feather stick together type of thing. But what kind of gave the story a renaissance was after his death in 1959, when the White Sox uh, won the American League pennant, we're back in the World Series 40 years later. And so I brought this story out, especially because Ray Schalk and, and Red Faber, like throughout the first pitch of the game one of the 1959 World Series at Comiskey Park. So I brought the story out again. Uh, but it, it did not ever have the, the fervor it had in the 20s when there was speculation about Buck getting reinstated. Uh, he really thought that he had a good chance of coming back and he you know, kept himself in shape with the belief he was going to play again. And obviously you talked about playing in the renegade leagues, which he did. I like to compare Shoeless Joe and Buck Weaver because they're kind of opposite sides of the same coin. Buck Weaver didn't take any money, but he was involved in the meetings. Shoeless Joe took money, but he had really no idea what was going on, or at least that's what the... There's very little evidence that he really did know the full extent of the fix, and he he had a great series. Do you think that their, their connection, that the, the the movement to get Shoeless Joe reinstated and Buck Weaver reinstated, do you think there's some parallels there or a connection between the two? Well, they were the two stars in the team, so I think that's the connection. Um, they both had limited roles in the fix, uh, but the difference is, you know, Jackson took the money and he spent it and, you know, Buck didn't get any money. And, you know, so there's, I think, different degrees of guilt. Um, so I think you have to, you have to keep that in mind. I mean, there's quite a bit of evidence that Jackson did attempt to tell Comiskey about the, the fix going on, that he had come to see Comiskey after game eight had finished on October 10th, 1919. Uh, tried to tell Comiskey about what was going on after the World Series and when Comiskey began his investigation. Uh, and uh, certainly when Harry Grabner went down to Savannah, Georgia to re-sign him for the 1920 season. Uh, and that's you know when he got his three-year three, three year deal, which he ended up suing for his 21 and 22-year uh, salary when he got kicked out of baseball at the end of 2000, uh, end of 1920. It's so interesting to me with with Buck Weaver is contractually or by the rules of baseball, did he have any obligation to tell? Maybe he had a moral obligation, but did he have a legal or contractual obligation to say that he knew anything about this conspiracy? Well, that's a, a really good question because there was not anything in his, his contract. He had a standard American League contract, didn't have anything about that. There wasn't the rule that was instated after the fix about that any player that knows about betting has to report it. That, that, whole, that whole thing that was on became on the wall of every dugout clubhouse in, in, in Major League Baseball it wasn't a rule till, uh after this happened. So that's kind of the, the issue was he didn't break any new known rule then. It, you know, basically he they were they were set as an examples uh to help purge baseball of, of gambling. Ironic is that you know gambling is part of baseball now. That's what even even I think even stranger. Yeah, well, I think that that I mean it goes a little bit off of Buck Weaver, but it seems like baseball and professional sports in general is really it's opened itself up tremendously to a hundred years later to the, a lot of the problems that uh, were percolating and happening in 1920 by making gambling so uh, in the forefront of professional sports. I agree. I think it's, you know, I mean, it certainly uh, um, is inconsistent with their past positions. And what do you say to someone like Buck Weaver when you know, baseball right now, you know, they have partners, you know, strategic business partners with gambling, and they encourage it. Uh, they, in, in Chicago, the Cubs are about to have this, they're building a new facility that just basically next to Wrigley Field is just going to basically be a, a betting facility. 
What did uh, Buck Weaver's nieces do to try and keep this issue going and to get Buck's name cleared? Well, um, the older niece, Betty, she worked for the Sun-Times and she helped keep his name out there, especially in the, in the mid 1990s when the first movement to, to, to get Joe Jackson and, and Buck Weaver cleared. So she had a lot of impetus from new sports writers like Jerome Holtzman. He had been named the first Major League Baseball historian. And he had personally was asked by the commissioner to investigate the situation, to give a recommendation. He recommended that Buck get cleared. Unfortunately, that recommendation was never acted on. But Betty did a lot to um, keep her uncle, surrogate father's name in the news and, and connected. Uh, there, there's, a, there's some mock trials that were done in Chicago on the, they called the trial of Buck Weaver and uh, Joe Jackson, which were had a lot of big legal heavy hitters in Chicago. Uh, some people from Sports Illustrated involved. That were some fun things that brought the story out there. There was a nice piece in the Wall Street Journal in the mid '90s about Buck. So she kept the story alive. Unfortunately, she was unsuccessful of getting any direct contact with the commissioner. So uh, she ends up dying. And uh, by 2002 is when I connected with the other um, uh, daughter and she was still alive. She was living down in uh, Missouri. Uh, And so that's who I contacted her and also another cousin of Buck's, being Marge Follett. And I asked him, I wanted to get involved. You know, I want to do something that um, that would be successful for uh, some potential resignation, reinstating project. So they said, fine. And so I went down to Missouri and met Pat, saw Buck's artifacts that he had, all these pictures and things like that. So um, it was a it was a fun Thing the first time I went down there to hear their excitement and how much pain it was to hear Buck how disappointed he was each time he got he got he got turned down. So uh, so Pat became the key person after her sister died, and so she got involved in her, in her cousin Marge. So in two thousand three, that's when we started the Clear Buck campaign. You had these T shirts that I'm wearing like this. Um, we did a protest at the All Star Game in Chicago in 2003. We felt that was an appropriate venue. All eyes in baseball would be there. And I was taking Marge and Pat to the game. And uh, I had seats that were close to where the commissioner was expected to sit. Uh, he was by the uh, on dugout circle for the White Sox dugout. And the seats I had were about 14 rows behind that. Uh, and so... We had a great uh, event before the, the the game. We did a lot of radio and TV about the story. It was all over the news. And um, we were on, fortunately, the commissioner did not see these two women, uh, even though they, they made themselves available. Uh, he did get quoted on TV about uh, he's looking into the situation, uh, but we were unsuccessful. Uh, I made several attempts to have a meeting with him in Milwaukee. We were about to have a meeting, got canceled because of the hurricane in 2005. Uh, I met him in person once, uh, just kept pushing the issue, pushing the issue, and uh, just got nowhere. And I wrote to him in right before he retired, asking him to do a, sort of a end of the term pardon, sort of like a presidential pardon <laughs> to, you know, to do that. And he, he, he wouldn't do it, which was sad. We even had we even got President Obama involved. Uh, Obama, at the time of the Ball Star game, was the senator from Illinois, and he wrote a letter to Major League Baseball on behalf of Buck. And we have it in the website. It's kind of cool to see that. But he got involved, uh, and uh, unfortunately, we were unsuccessful. But we kept Pat out there. We did a Sabre event in 2013. Uh, Society of American Base- Baseball Research was in Philadelphia, and you know, a lot of these baseball Fanatics loved meeting Pat because she was one of the last living links to the Black Sox. She was just great telling her story. And um, so 
one last push was done in 2014, 2015. Uh, she did a lot of television, big push by the Chicago Tribune from John Owens. I uh, had some other stories were done nationally. I had, met, had written Manford, who was the new commissioner, and he um, you know, said he was not going to overrule the, uh, the decision of a previous commissioner. He actually quoted from the article he talked about in the Sports Illustrated article as one of his rationales for not reinstating Buck. Interesting, the same day that he sent me the letter about Buck not being reinstated, he wrote a similar letter about Joe Jackson. So they both basically got turned down forever uh, in 2015. And we've not really made much of an attempt to do anything further. Steve here again with a quick word from our sponsors. I wonder what the family thought about the portrayal of Buck in the 1988 movie. Were they approving of the way John Cusack played him uh, and John Cusack, if I'm not mistaken, he is a Chicago uh, guy too. Did he in any way get involved in this? He did. Well, he didn't get involved in the campaign. We tried to um, get him involved. I think your, your first part of your question, what do the family think? The family loved his portrayal. Uh, they actually, um, he spent time with Betty Scanlon, uh, the older sister of Pat, the one who died who'd worked at the Sun-Times. So he did a lot of background with her to get what Buck was like. Uh, And so they really liked that fact. Um, He had also had some instruction on how to play third base from Ron Sando and Ron Sando's son, Jeff, at Comiskey Park, the new park, but and also at Wrigley Field. So it'd it'd be credible. I I need to correct myself. It was the old Comiskey Park because 1988 was still up there. Uh, the, the park where the series was at. It wasn't until 1990 when the park was being torn down, but they tried to get him to look credible. They felt he did a great job. So the family is very, very proud of the betrayal uh, that he gave in the movie. Uh, in 2005, when the White Sox went to the World Series, I had gotten a box for game seven, and John had accepted my invitation to be at the game, game seven in 2005. Well, the White Sox you know, swept the, the Astros four straight. There wasn't a game seven. So the invitation went, went away. I know he's very proud of his role um, with uh, uh, playing Buck. Uh, Kuzak is more of a Cubs fan than he is a Sox fan, but he grew up in Evanston. Uh, and so he obviously you know, has a passion for Chicago sports. What would the a whole process of having – Buck Weaver reinstated into baseball look like? And what would his status be? Because as you said, he didn't have enough years in to be officially inducted into the Hall of Fame. So what would reinstatement look like in a hundred and change years later? Well, that was a question that always came up with. What does it matter? I mean, because he's dead, he's not going to be a Hall of Fame candidate like Joe Jackson should be in an automatic lock for the Hall of Fame with his his career. What matters is a sense of honor that when there's always a stain over him that he was a cheater and by being reinstated, he will have his reputation restored that Major League Baseball erred in their decision to for a lifetime ban. Uh, There has been some discussion about a possibly some legal action regarding his unfair suspension without due process. I don't know how good that would do, but I think the biggest thing would be uh, the family's honor and also for Buck, even though he's no longer with us on this earth, just knowing that his story was important enough for his family and people who loved him as a ball player cared enough to clear his name. And that's sort of the whole genesis of of the of the campaign, very similar to what uh, the Mudd family did after uh, Dr. Mudd had taking care of John Wilkes Booth after he he shot Lincoln. You know, he got prosecuted for that and their family finally ended up getting him him, him, uh, pardoned for that, even though it was posthumous. That was what they wanted. They wanted some recognition about, you know, like Dr. Mudd was not involved in the the conspiracy that killed Lincoln. He was doing his job as a physician to help a patient. So that's sort of a, you know, where we see things that it would just be nice to see some recognition 
that his role is different than the seven others. You said that, that there was a big push in 2014, 2015. Where do you stand right now? Are you in kind of stasis right now? Or are you, is there any plans to, I mean, we, we're coming out of pandemic and a lot of things are going on. Is there another push that you have planned? Um, Pat died in early um 2020. So and she's gone. I still am in touch with her family. I went to uh, a celebration of life with her in Wisconsin where their family's at. Um, we had plans to do in 2020, that year when the, the first Fields of Dream game was set up with the White Sox and the Yankees, that we were going to do a protest at that game. We felt that that was going to be another high opportunity, especially since the whole game is about the Black Sox. And, you know, they made it happen. Their story of redemption uh, and they're celebrating that for baseball is, you know, what, what better person, and obviously I know why Kevin Costner threw out the first pitch, but we were really trying to advocate someone like Pat to throw out the first pitch since she was the last living connection of any family member um, that you know, knew Buck, lived with Buck. And I, we thought that would be really some, uh, poetic justice. Unfortunately, the pandemic uh, prevented that in 2020. Uh, and then by the time they did it in 2021, logistically, it would have been difficult, even if we'd gotten tickets to do a protest because of how they were planning to do the entry to the, the, the farm site. We just would not have been successful. It would have been blocked by Major League Baseball security we didn't have a problem with Major League Baseball security in 2003 when we did the, the protests outside uh, uh, Comiskey Park, U.S. Cellular Field, now Guaranteed Rate Field in 2003. If people want to get involved and learn more about your organization, uh, what can they do? Well, they can take a look at the, we have a website, clearbuck.com. You know, one word, it's got a story, it's got pictures, it's got a history, it's got a lot of the news media that was done, it's got a a copy of the letter that Manfred wrote in 2015, you know, saying tough luck, you know, we're not going to reinstate Buck. So we got a lot of stuff with, with that. Um, I think is that there's a, a lot of resurgence about the Black Sox and, and, you know, and there's so many books that have come out in the last 15 years. And a lot of that came out of some of the work we did in 2003 with um, uh, a, a writer named Jim, Gene Cardi. Unfortunately, he died in 2009, but Gene and I are the ones that went to Elliot's house in Upper New York in 2003 to, to get more background on how he wrote Eight Men Out. So that's a book I'd recommend people look, look for it called Burying the Black Sox by Gene Carney. But there's so many good resources out there to tell the story. But you know, I would start off with just going to our website. It's, it's got a, a kind of a petition. You can still send a, uh, a note to... Uh, Commissioner Manford of, about Buck. We sort of just decided to let the story lay low for a bit, and um, also, you know, some of the supporters have, have just recommended waiting, waiting for a new commissioner. And um, we thought that possibly could could happen because of the, the baseball strike, but it ended up getting resolved. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, it's it's sort of a on pause right now, but not, you know, it's not a story. It's not dead. Uh, so that's where we're at. I, I want to thank you so much for your time. I think there really is the, the case is compelling. I mean, I'm showing my cards here. I really do think that Buck Weaver, he just didn't really do anything to make him get this such a, a such a tough sentence and to really have this uh, black cloud over his name a hundred years later. It just wasn't, it was not fitting to what he did. Well, I agree. Um, but he was someone who didn't let that black cloud ruin his life. And he continued to be and you know, meet with his teammates. Uh, they continue to recognize him as a pre premier baseball player. Uh, you know, Ray Schalk, Red Faber, you know, you know, said, you know, Buck got a raw deal. It was a horrible what happened, but they didn't exclude him from, from going to postseason baseball events and dinners. He participated. Uh, he only went back to Comiskey Park one time after he got banned because uh, it was too hard for him. So his 
play on the field in, in, in 1919 is what I think is the most important thing he wants to be remembered for. And there was a uh, story in the Cincinnati Post was posted the day after the story, after the, after the Reds won. And it basically said this, though they are hopeless and heartless, the White Sox have a hero. He's George Weaver, who plays and fights at third base. Day after day, Weaver has done his work and smiled. In spite of the certain fate that closed about the hopes of the White Sox, Weaver smiled and scrapped. One by one, his mates gave up, but Weaver continued to grin and fought harder. And that, that's, that was in the Cincinnati paper after the Reds had won. And that's what Buckwood wanted to be remembered by. And I think it's one of the best stories about him. Oh, that's a great way to end it. I want to thank. our players.